Good day. Welcome to another edition of Seekers of Meeting, the podcast arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. Thank you very, very much for spending some time with us today. With these podcasts, we hope to explore some of the issues that touch us, or touch on us, our families, and our community in light of the revolution in longevity. And we appreciate very much your support. You can connect with us, uh, visit our homepage, jewishsacredaging.com. And if you want to contact me directly, Rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. And it's with great pleasure that I welcome to uh, today's Secrets of Meeting TV show and podcast, Dr. Karen Greenberg, the Director of Neurologic Emergency Department, Global Neuroscience Institute at Crozier Chester Medical Center. <laughs> As I said before, Karen, that's, that's a lot to get on the t-shirt. Um, but anyway, thank you very, very much for taking time out of your very, very busy schedule uh, in the emergency room at Crozer and your specialty. We want to talk to you about basically what, what you've dedicated your career to in medicine, not only emergency room, but really with a specialty dealing with strokes and neurological diseases, neurological challenges. So first of all, um, how are you? How's everybody? How are you feeling? So I'm doing, I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. It's always uh, day to day right now in the pandemic and life in general, but I am super excited to see you and talk to you today and have this opportunity. Today's a good day. I've gotten my first dose of the COVID vaccine and I'm oh, scheduled for my second dose next week. And uh, that is helping relieve some of the stressors of going to work every day, knowing that I have some protection. And uh, we'll get there. Well, I, let, let us let us pray. Um, let me let let's talk about let let's talk about your special because there's um, with the growth in longevity and uh, so many more people living longer and living better. Um, the issue of is strokes and. Could let's just start with the basic Aleph bet, and, and and I am not a doctor, um, so you can pardon the the very very elementary questions. Could you define what a stroke is? Yes, absolutely. The way that I like to describe it to people, because I think it's relatable, is you want to think of a stroke as a brain attack. So if a heart attack is a clogged vessel to one of the vessels in the heart. You want to think of a stroke as a brain attack or a clogged vessel to one of the arteries in the brain. Stroke is a little bit different because there's two types of stroke. There's the ischemic stroke, which is what I just described. That's the heart attack, blockage in the heart, stroke, brain attack, blockage in the brain. The other type of stroke you can have is you can actually have a hemorrhagic stroke, which is where the brain actually bleeds into the tissue. But that would be how I break it down on a day-to-day -day basis for my patients and their families. So what are, are there danger signs? Is there something, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the heart attack, you know, there's a numbness, this, uh, whatever. Are there warning signs of, of, of either of these two types of strokes? Yes, absolutely. And what I'll preface this with is there are very few things in emergency medicine that are actually emergent. Heart attack would be one, and stroke is really the other. The five things that you want to watch out for for stroke, number one is any type of weakness or numbness to one side of the body. So things that localize to one side of the body, you really want to pay attention to. The second thing is any trouble with your speech, whether that's the physical component of the speech, like you're slurring, or speech like you're having trouble finding the words that you want to say, or maybe I'm having trouble understanding what you're asking me on this podcast. The third is any sudden change in your vision double vision, blurry vision, loss of vision. So not only do our eyes control our sight, but the back part of our brain and the neurovisual pathways control sight as well. The fourth would be any kind of trouble with your balance. If you notice that you're walking funny, maybe you're shuffling your gait, 
Maybe it's a wide stanced gate. Maybe it's just that you walk directly into the wall, even though you're trying to walk straight. And then the fifth thing would be if you get a sudden onset of a severe headache without any explanation, that's more the warning sign of the bleeding type of stroke that I described. So just, just recap really quickly the top five. So sudden onset numbness or weakness, speech problems, vision problems, gait problems, and then a severe headache. And what I'd like to emphasize with you and your podcast audience is a lot of people ignore their stroke symptoms. And I kind of dedicate my career not only towards clinical, but educating the community. A lot of people will say, well, my arm's just kind of weak and clumsy, but it's not painful, so I'm not gonna get to the emergency department. Or I'm having trouble with my speech, I'm gonna give it a few hours to see if it gets better. And what I really want people on this podcast to understand is if you suspect you're having a stroke, you need to get to us in the emergency department right away. Don't call your family doctor. Don't go to urgent care for this. You need to come to the emergency department. And the reason for that is even where we're at in 2021 right now, we really have limited therapies for what we can do for stroke. The one medication that I have in the ER, which is a clot busting type of medicine that I can give through an IV, you can only qualify for that medicine if you get to me within four and a half hours. So no going to sleep, no taking a nap, no waiting it out. Time to come see me in the emergency department. So somebody may be listening to this and say, well, you know, the other day or yesterday I was walking around the Acme or, or the ShopRite and, uh, uh, you know, and, and I, I was having trouble remembering the, 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 what I was supposed to get on the, on the, on the list before I went out. And, and I sort of like, you know, was kind of dizzy and stuff like that. Do you have to have all five of these things? Uh, will somebody present something because, you know, maybe the, for a variety of different reasons and it's not a stroke it just means that they just forgot something i mean how do you begin to i'm, I'm sure you get this question um <laughs> and for those of us who are hypochondriacs if we have right. even the smidgen of one of these things we're already going to defcon five and i, I there may be a couple of people listening to this who who share that uh, that but are all these all five of these things necessary to present themselves or just one in a severe way, trigger this response. You're right, fair enough. So any one of those five symptoms that I listed can be a sign of stroke. And uh, you know, the, the memory thing, you know, heck, I'm, I'm in my early 40s and I suffer with the memory thing. <laughs> what I would say to, you know, the members that are listening today is we really have a campaign, campaign going to overreact to a possible stroke. And what that means is if you're concerned, come see us in healthcare and let us decide for you. And again, why it's so important is not only did I mention the time frame for really the one and only medication treatment that we have for stroke, I can break it down even further and tell you if you're having stroke symptoms, so you're slurring your words, you're having trouble understanding, for every minute that goes by, two million of the brain cells are dying. So this is one of those true emergencies where if you can get to me, I can literally save two million brain cells for every minute you get to me sooner. Is there a, way, is, is there a lifestyle issue of, uh, or prevention? Uh, uh, is there a medication even over the counter that you can take that will prevent or is how do how do I change my life or live my life so that I can lower the odds of me getting a stroke? Sure, the risk factors for stroke are really the same. Again, if we kind of equate it to the heart, so some modifiable things we can't modify your age. What's interesting, we talk about who's listening to your podcast and the Jewish sacred aging. So once you get over 65, that's 75% of the patients who are having strokes. And for every decade 
past 55, every decade that goes by, your risk of having a stroke doubles. So we can't really affect your age. We can't really affect your gender. And what's interesting about gender and stroke, it's actually women that have more strokes than men. So if men have more heart attacks, women have more strokes than men. And it's a pretty significant amount. It's about 20,000 more people. Has any, uh, do we know why that? Because that's an interesting <laughs> statistic. Yes. Uh, women. So this kind of factors in, this doesn't factor into our population that we're talking to today, but pregnancy and hormone use. Uh, so hormone use might apply to postmenopausal women. Women have um, more heart arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation, and that can be a risk factor for stroke. So we do have some data as to why women more so than men get strokes. But it's really interesting that not only do you want to think about age, but you already always want to think about gender. Now, those are two things that we can't modify. What are things that we can modify? High blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking. So if you're a smoker, you got to stop. Smoking's bad. If we haven't figured that out in 2021, we're never going to figure that out. So you really need to stop smoking if you're a smoker. Other things that are modifiable are your diet. We always want to be eating healthy and we always want to be exercising as much as we can. And for the population that's listening to us today, I would say it's about three to five times a week that you want to be exercising. Other things that we can't modify would be things like race. So African Americans and Hispanic Latinos actually have more strokes than whites and Caucasians. And we can't really modify family history. If there's family history of heart attack and stroke, that does make it a risk factor for you as well. So those are the things that we're going to ask you about when you come to the emergency department. And those are the things that you want to be prepared to talk to us about and let us know what those risk factors that you have, like hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, family history might be. You know, we read a lot of times in the popular press when, when people talk about this, uh, about certain foods. So for example, I, I've always been taught like salt, if, uh, too much salt is, it will, will, is, could lead to a stroke. I, and, and nobody's ever told me why, but they've just been told me. Uh, and also the American, the quote, American diet with processed foods <laughs> and fast right. foods. I mean, is there any truth to this or is this, as we say in the Talmud, Bubba Meiser? <laughs> I like that. I'm going to use that. So with my experience of working through the pandemic in 2020 that's carrying over into 2021, you know, it really just has to be everything in moderation, right? So high salt is going to contribute to hypertension. Fatty foods, high sugar foods is going to contribute to diabetes. You know, I'm not here to tell you that you can't have any fun in life, especially when we're quarantining and living at home and restricting on our daily activities. A good way to think about it is just everything in moderation. So not a diet of uh, Big Macs, Whoppers, and Cokes? No, but I guess if you buy stock <laughs> in McDonald's or Burger King, then, you know, that's a different conversation. And if, and if, you're, alive to, if you're alive to reap the benefits. Um, <laughs> The treatment, the treatment, uh, ha, what's, what's the progress in treatment of strokes is, or let me put it from, I guess, a more negative way. Is a stroke a death sentence? Let's talk about stroke and death versus disability. We're actually doing a much better job with the rate of stroke death. So what do I mean by that? Stroke used to be the third leading cause of death, and it's actually now the fifth. So it goes heart disease, cancer, respiratory illnesses, trauma, and then stroke. And what's interesting is we'll stay tuned. It might actually be the sixth leading cause of death in 2020 because COVID moved up to number three. Re really interesting. We're doing a much better job of mortality and death from stroke. 
really key that I want to discuss with you and your listeners is that stroke is the number one leading cause of disability. You're not necessarily going to die from your stroke, but disability can't speak, paralyzed on one side of your body, maybe full-time resident in a nursing home, maybe a feeding tube because it affects your swallowing and your speech and you can't eat. So I'm talking significant disability with stroke. And that's why it's so important to recognize those symptoms and get to us as soon as you can. Because most patients actually won't die from stroke, but they'll end up significantly disabled. And the way we want to think of disability is needing assistance in what we call your activities of daily living. So your activities of daily living are driving, cooking, bathing yourself. Think about if a stroke knocks out just half of your vision. You wouldn't be able to drive. You might not be able to just balance a checkbook because you can't see everything that's in front of you. You might not even want to go to a store because you're afraid you're going to bump into people. So we are talking about some significant disability that can happen with stroke. That leads in to the opportunities for treatment that you asked about. What's really neat about stroke is we are making a lot of progress with stroke. Stroke is one of those disease entities where we really do push the envelope day to day. And it's really exciting to be a specialist in stroke. What we have is we have a clot busting medication that we can give you through your IV if you get to us within four and a half hours of onset and you don't have any other contraindications. The biggest contraindication to getting that IV clot busting medication is not getting to us within that four and a half hours. But there are other things that we have to watch for. Your blood pressure has to be a certain number. You can't be on other anticoagulants that maybe your listeners are on for that heart arrhythmia that I talked about, atrial fibrillation, or blood clots in the legs or the heart, a deep vein thrombosis, or a pulmonary embolism. So those medications are Pradaxa, Eliquis, and Xarelto. And who's the population of patients that are on those medications? It's age 65 and older. Not everybody's a candidate for that IV medication. If your stroke is being caused by a clot in what we call one of the large vessels of the brain. And I'm gonna just get a little technical. That would mean your internal carotid artery or one of the cerebral arteries of the brain. So cerebral meaning brain, artery of the brain. If there's a clot in one of those vessels, we actually have imaging now that can tell us that number one, your brain is not getting enough blood flow from the stroke. And number two, can pinpoint where that blockage is. So the neurosurgeons that I work really closely with every day, I work with about 10 different neurosurgeons. Super cool, super neat what they can do. If a heart catheterization is going through your groin to open a vessel in the heart, a brain catheterization to put to break it down they can go through your groin or go through your radial artery in your wrist and get into your brain to remove that clot wow and patients that can qualify for that get pretty decent outcomes wow that that is uh, as we would say pretty cool <laughs> that's uh no that that um wow that's that's good to know. That's good to know. So this is this is very exciting and and, and very valuable information. The um, I got to also ask you, what's you're an ER doc. You you what's it like now? How stressful, challenging, crazy, off the wall, unbelievable when you go into that uh, hospital emergency room is it right now with the pandemic? We're 11 months into this craziness. And yes. um, what, are you, what are you feeling? H how do you feel? I mean, just dealing with this. So I know that this is a safe place and I'm lucky enough to have you as my personal rabbi. So you know some extra challenges that came with 2020. Yeah, so for your too. listeners, my dad passed away the end of February 
his funeral was March 1st. And when I came back to work on March 10th was really the start of the pandemic and seeing the cases in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. We now know that it was here, but we weren't really seeing those cases until March. And it's been incredibly challenging to be a frontline provider. When I went to medical school and residency and took the Hippocratic Oath that I would care for other people, I never really understood the magnitude of something like this pandemic that is so contagious and so transmittable that I could actually put my own health at risk and then put loved ones at risk as well. So my boyfriend, my parent, my mother, my sister and her family, my friends, because it's really important to have that network. You know, being an emergency medicine provider is stressful enough day in and day out. And then to be afraid that you can contract a lethal disease yourself is very, very stressful. It adds in another component that nobody could have ever prepared us for. The last pandemic happened in 1914 to 1918 of the Spanish flu, right? Maybe there's a handful of physicians that are 100 years old who have lived through both pandemics. And it's been really challenging. Uh, I haven't seen my sister or her family since dad's funeral. That was March 1st. And we're doing this podcast on February 19th. I have seen my mother twice, I think. And uh, now she lives in Florida and I live in New Jersey. So it's not like she's right around the corner. It's, uh, it's been very challenging. The one thing that did help is that not a lot changed for me job-wise. I still wake up in the morning, I still get out of the house and go to work for my 10-hour shift. So that has at least been some normalcy. The everything shutting down for those three months, you forget about what your outlets are, how important it is to just go get a manicure or go get a massage for yourself or just be able to eat in a restaurant and you know, you know, not have to cook yourself dinner after a 12 hour shift. I am hopeful that 2021 is going to be better. I mean, let's face it, it has to be, right? I've already gotten my first dose of the vaccine. I'm scheduled for my second dose next week. And I do believe in the science. And I think that's really important for your listeners to, to hear. Yes, this is the fastest vaccine in the history of the world, but it's also 2020 and 2021, and all of our greatest minds, not just here in the United States, but across the world, banded together to make this for us. And the data is strong. The data is strong that, it's, that it works and it's safe. I'll tell you that I've gotten it. My colleagues have gotten it. Trust the science. Karen, in the midst of what you're describing and the stress and the pressures and the changes in these shifts at the ER and, and, and seeing the day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day daily challenges, what sustains you? What, what sustains you as a human being, not necessarily as a doctor, but as Karen in this, in this almost year-long struggle? I'm not gonna lie, it's been challenging. Some days, are, some days are better than others. I think that truly what sustains me is that I've always had an, an internal drive. I, and truthfully, I got a lot of that from my father who I, who I miss every day. And he taught me to persevere, you know, adapt and overcome what obstacles are in front of you. But also I think at the end of the day is that it is an opportunity and it's perhaps an even more interesting opportunity than it's been ever in my career because we are not allowing visitors in the emergency department or in the hospital. The patients really just have the ER staff, whether that's the physician or the nurse 
or the tech that's working that day. Maybe it's an x-ray tech or a CT tech. You know, it's really created an opportunity to relate to the patients, speak with their family members over the phone and say, it's going to be okay. We've got your family member. And even though, as I said, some days are better than others, and don't get me wrong, the bad days are bad, right? Those are when we lose patients and have to tell their families. But the good days, you know, when we do save patients or we make a great save and we get them to the ICU and ultimately discharge back home, those are the, those are the days that I cherish and that keeps me moving forward. Well, thank you, Dr. Karen Greenberg. Um, and you, you made your dad very proud. Let me just say that. Thank Dr. You so Karen much. Greenberg, the, the director of, I want to give your whole title here. It's going to take a couple minutes. Just relax. <laughs> the director of Neurologic Emergency Department, Global Neuroscience Institute at Crozier Chester Medical Center in Chester, Pennsylvania. Karen, thank you very, very much. And uh, thank you for what you do every single day. And um, for all your dedication and expertise, and most of all, for your neshama, that soul that helps those patients. That's the most important thing. Um, say hello to your family for me. And I thank you very much. I sure you take will. Care. Thanks, Rabbi. Thank you. To all of you, thank you again for today's uh, listening and watching all of today's edition of Secrets of Meeting, the podcast and TV show of Jewish Sacred Aging. Remember, the show is available on the uh, TV broadcast Roku platform, as well as a variety of other places you get your podcasts, including Apple. Again, we welcome your comments and suggestions. You can email me at rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. We invite you to visit the Facebook page, Jewish Sacred Aging on Facebook. And you can again email me with comments and suggestions to rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. And if you'd like to make a tax-free donation to help support the work of Jewish Sacred Aging and these podcasts, please go to the website, jewishsacredaging.com and click on the conveniently located donate button. Seekers of Meeting is produced at the Broadcast Center of Lubetkin Media Companies in just beautiful Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And we thank our producer, Steve Lubetkin. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. I look forward to greeting you again on our next Seekers of Meeting TV show and podcast. Stay safe, stay healthy. Shalom. Shalom.